Welcome to today's webinar, The Current State of Automated Content Tagging and Dangers, dangers and Opportunities. Anna? Greetings and welcome to this joint TCMI ASIS webinar. I am Anna Batista, the chair of TCMI. It is my pleasure today to introduce the joint webinar series and today's presenter and topic. The joint TCMI ACIS webinars are presented as a service to members of TCMI and ACIS and to guests. The purpose of the joint series is to advance the discourse and practices of innovative metadata. This webinar is presented by Joseph Bush, founder of Taxonomy Strategies, past president of the Association for Information Science and Technology and past member of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative Executive Committee. The webinar will describe how to run trials with artificial intelligence tools for automated content tagging and will show some results from actual trials. You will have an opportunity to ask the presenters questions near the close of the webinar. There is a panel on the right of your screen to enter the text of your questions. We ask that you wait to enter your text until near the end of the webinar. I will moderate the questions and answers. We will address as many questions as our time allows. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Joseph. Um, thank you, Anna. So uh, welcome to Dublin Core Summer School. Um, it's uh, great. There's been a number of webinars um, over the last uh, month or so, and I've been to them all, and they're all quite interesting. Um, and I hope you'll find um, my talk this morning of interest. Um, I'll, I'll try to uh, be as brief as possible so that we have time for questions, at least 15 minutes, because um, I think there's lots of things to discuss. Um, so, uh, Let's get my slides moving here. Oops. Okay, so about a year ago, I went to a conference where there was a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, several vendors gave presentations, but there was not a lot of detail about what they considered to be AI and how this differed from information retrieval or IR. Um, IR is the use of technology to process content to identify patterns based on a combination of natural language processing and statistics. And, and I think when you look at what's being called AI today, an awful lot of it is at least based on a foundation of natural language processing and statistics, which is at the heart of information retrieval technology. Um, which includes two major uh, types of um, applications that we see a lot today. One is search, and the other is automated categorization. So I want to talk first about automated tagging in general. Um, so the natural world is filled with patterns. Some patterns may be inherent in the nature of things. Consider a snowflake. Other patterns may be overlaid on the natural world to make sense of it in human terms and consider the constellations of the zodiac. Um, yet others may be overlaid on the human-made world to make sense of large amounts of information. Consider file naming systems. So people create guidelines and procedures to try to make naming and description complete and consistent. But studies have shown that people are inherently inconsistent. And if you'd like to look at studies, I've posted a written uh, script for this talk, and there's a, a quite a lengthy bibliography about uh, indexing inconsistency. It's not a new topic. It's something that's been researched in the past, but it has particular relevance when we talk about automated categorization, IR and, and AI. Um, so 
these studies um, basically show that even though the same person on different days or a different, uh, that, that the same person on different days or even at different times of the day may make different choices when they categorize and describe content. And that's generally been called inter-indexer inconsistency. Um, and these studies um, that were done in the past and continue to be done sort of show that this human inconsistency is, is very significant. Um, it's interesting to note that with IR methods, um, they actually perform somewhat more consistently than people do. But the mistakes that are made are often much more extreme. But they're also more consistent and more easily discovered than the inconsistency made by human indexers. So, um, and this is a kind of important, um, important uh, concept. The goal of automation is to try to provide some consistency. And um, I'll argue in a second that the, the best situation is one in which we have a combination of, um, of uh, automation that provides and leads us towards consistency. Um, and we have people who are basically taking that and using it to, or refining it, so that we can add that uh, context that's very difficult to get with, with automation. So, as I said, a better scenario than either people or machines is to use automation to process content and then let human experts review um, and, uh, or I call, approve and improve the results. This can lead to more consistency and the improvements made by humans provide feedback that can be used to improve the algorithms over time. Okay, so what's all this talk about AI really about? Uh, I think that much of what's called AI is really automation, not autonomous machine intelligence, which is technically what AI is, although applications may sometimes appear to be smart. There are some important trends that are encouraging this type of large-scale automation, and I'd just like to talk about those briefly. So the first one is cloud computing. Um, and basically this, uh, this is having, I think, a really big impact on the interest in using automation. Um, so standing up data processing intens intensive applications used to require appropriately specifying and acquiring a large powerful, powerful computer and lots of data storage capacity, as well as installing and configuring complicated software and aggregating large content collections. All of that infrastructure had to be maintained. Today, you can subscribe to cloud services that provide whatever capacity you need, and it can be extended. The second trend is that there's readily available IR software as a service. Um, you know, one of the best known ones is IBM Watson. It's a well-known example of so-called AI software as a service. And some of it is uh, uh, truly AI and some of it is automation. Um, IBM basically offers a bunch of solutions and tools, including IR tools, um, as what's currently called the IBM Cloud. Uh, formerly, it was branded as something called Bluemix. Um, other vendors, large and small, offer software as a service that includes information retrieval services. And some of these are, General Electric has a service called Predix. Um, there's a, there's some small companies like Lexalytics that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, there's a company called Data Harmony um, um, uh, uh, out of um, um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Margie Lava, who's very active in Dublin Core, is the president, and they've been doing this for a long time. Um, another company is Expert System. Um, Mondeca, Pool Party, and Smart Logic. Um, some of these are, are are people who are very active in the uh, Dublin Core community. Um, some are U.S., some are European. They all now offer cloud-based services or software as a service. And the third trend is what we call the Internet of Things or IoT. Um, more and more commercial and consumer machines and devices are gathering and sharing data. This may be a big industrial machine, such as a GE turbine in a power plant, or a Rolls-Royce jet engine, or a Samsung smart refrigerator, 
or an Amazon Echo or an Apple iPhone or a Dell laptop computer. They're all collecting information and that information is, um, is interconnected. Um, there are lots of issues associated with that, but basically we live in an interconnected world and all of these devices and appliances that we use are now part of this internet of things. So we've got, um, we've got cheap infrastructure, um, which includes um, the basic uh, processing power um, and storage. We've got software as a service, um, and we've got lots and lots of content that's being collected through this Internet of Things. So what are some of the things that we can do with all of this stuff? Um, and again, this is, um, this is a list of uh, pretty standard automated tagging methods and tools that are used by applications. And whether you use or, or go to the IBM stack or the GE stack or Lexalytics or Data Harmony, they all have bits and pieces of this incorporated into them. And they may be um, just a bunch of, um, of tools and methods that you can assemble yourself, or they may be full-blown applications with user interfaces. And much of this is available and based on open source as well. So if you have the capability to go out and um, build your own applications, this is mostly in the public domain. What is special is the way it gets packaged and the user interfaces that are applied and the services that are offered. So uh, just very quickly, entity extraction. So this is the ability to identify named entities. And these are things like people, organizations, places, events, and themes. Um, uh, another method is sentiment analysis. That's basically analyzing um, some content to provide some measure of positive positivity or negativity. It's usually returned as some sort of numerical measure. Um, and it's a you know, positive sentiment or a negative sentiment. Um, a third component is keyword extraction, um, and that's the ability to uh, simply extract meaningful keywords and phrases from content. So basic natural language processing that identifies noun phrases, and in those noun phrases, uh, looks for the ones that are distinct and appear to be particularly salient or meaningful given a particular context. A fourth one is summarization. That's the ability to process content and do key sentence extraction at the coarsest level, um, then taking those and doing interesting things to make it appear to be more like a human generated summary um, is what's involved in that activity. Um, the fifth one is predefined Boolean queries. And this is a method to generate rules that are based on uh, predefined topics um, that would allow you to um, uh, assign relevant descriptors from a, pre from a predefined set to a particular content item. So this is really difficult, and this, this is similar to basically doing subject indexing against a predefined set of categories. This is something that, um, that artificial intelligence is particularly bad at, um, uh, partly because it's difficult to find um, uh, uh, clear and distinct examples um, that uh, can be used. So we'll talk a little bit about this predefined Boolean query method a little bit later. Um, there's uh, training, um, uh, trained categorizers. That's where you have a set of discrete examples that are used to identify predefined topics fully uh, in a fully or semi-automated way. Um, and then finally, there are statistical categorizers. Um, and these are methods to basically process a collection um, uh, to automatically identify the words and phrases that are closely associated with predefined topics. Um, and further, statistical categorizers uh, create a digital signature, typically a vector, um, that represents a particular category. Um, and um, you, when you process a collection, you, want, you generate these digital signatures, which identify uh, clusters of content that appears to be similar based on these digital signatures. So these are the, kind of the set of tools that you generally have available. There are other variations, but this is a pretty good summary of the basic uh, toolkit. So AI is simply intelligence that's exhibited by machines. Today, most artificial intelligence is based on processing of large collections of content that are being created by people and their interactions with each other through social networks, 
on machines for applications, as well as machines doing the functions they have been built to perform. And that would be more this Internet of Things. Artificial intelligence uses information retrieval to process collections of content and data. The difference is that the patterns in the results are used as rules by machines rather than people. These rules are called machine learning. This works well with some applications where patterns are less ambiguous or nuanced by cultural bias, such as machine telemetry or image recognition, but not so well with language. It all depends on the nature and quality of the examples used to train the algorithms. In fact, there is no difference, um, it's no different than training using IR statistical categorizers. Having discrete examples is critical to accuracy. As far as I can tell, artificial intelligence is the automation of information retrieval. So in the next section, I'd like to talk about predefined Boolean queries. Um, in machine learning, all you need to provide is lots of content. The system figures out what it's about. But the problem with machine learning is that it's opaque. It's difficult to understand why an item is considered relevant. Categories are generic, may be irrelevant, can be biased, and are difficult to change or refine. But what if you want to categorize a collection against a predefined set of categories? One way to do this is to develop a set of Boolean queries that scope the context for each category. This is much more transparent than machine learning, and it provides relevant categories, but it requires a lot of work to set up and specialized skills. So this is basically the problem that we see. We have these automated methods um, that are um, you know, very simple. It doesn't require a lot of work, but the results, excuse me, really suck. Um, if you want to approach this uh, to, in a way where you create meaningful categories, um, like for example, a taxonomy, um, you can do this by generating a bunch of queries. And those queries take time to build and refine, um, but they're going to give you a set of relevant categories for a particular application. Um, right now, the pendulum is very much slung to the machine learning side. And the reason is that people are really scared uh, to make a commitment to have people involved in the process. And they ask the question, what is good enough? Um, and is the, are the results of these automated processes good enough? And I would say for certain applications, as I said, where we're dealing with um, we're dealing with data, when we're dealing with images in, in certain kinds of content applications, it's great. Um, we can identify patterns that are anomalies um, that can trigger a process that can um, um, uh, involve the, the maintenance or repair or um, investigation of a particular situation. But when we come to uh, questions that involve um, the meaning of content, particularly without cultural bias, it becomes, it's extremely difficult to do that with confidence uh, with machine learning alone. So I wanna talk a little bit about Boolean queries because it's not a new technique. It's actually quite an old technique, uh, but I think it has, um, people have forgotten about it. And I think that we need to remind people of these methods. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how they work. And then I wanna show an example of a case study that we've been working on uh, where it's been quite effective. So what are Boolean queries? Um, and I apologize to those who know this forwards and backwards, but in my discussions with people recently, I find that a lot of people have no idea what the heck these are. Um, so it's very simple. Um, it's basic operators uh, for uh, and, or, or not, conjunction, disjunction, and negative. Um, and they're represented by these Venn diagrams that you see down below. That's it. It's simple logic. Um, applying it to queries. It's very simple, actually using it um, to, as a syntax to develop uh, some meaningful sets of expressions or semantics is 
takes quite a lot of, of skill. But the basic concepts are extremely simple. Boolean queries are often used with proximity search. Uh, proximity searching is a way to search for two or more words that occur within a certain number of words from each other or within a section of a document. Um, one thing about proximity operators, so Boolean operators are pretty standard. Um, everybody knows what they are, and when they're implemented, they, op they have a, a, a fairly standard syntax. Proximity operators, on the other hand, are not. There's, there's, there's quite a bit of variation in the way they're used, although they generally have the objective of providing some proximity or context within which you're finding or looking for uh, words and phrases. And they have, um, the, um, the, there are various types of proximity operators. Examples would be near or not near or followed by or not followed by or in the same sentence or far away or in the same paragraph or the same section. But the basic idea is to provide some context for the Boolean query. And a few more things. Um, uh, query syntax for Boolean queries also includes bounded phrases, usually with quotations. So that lets us identify um, noun phrases like health insurance with quotations. Um, a second thing that we usually have available is truncation, right, left, and internal these days, that's fairly standard. Um, so that lets us um, take a, um, uh, to do stemming or to identify stemming explicitly rather than to have it be done automatically by the system. Um, it can be done with an individual term like child with an asterisk, which would retrieve child and children, um, or uh, something that's a bound phrase um, like pre-existing condition or conditions. Um, and then the third uh, concept in query syntax is nested statements. So that's the use of parentheses to basically create um, more complex expressions using Boolean, um, the Boolean logic. So for example, uh, here's an example of a, a statement uh, where we want health insurance, but we want it in the context of children um, or pre-existing conditions. So the next thing I'd like to share with you is just a, a, a little bit about how to create a Boolean query. Um, so, um, we've been doing a lot of this and it's something that, again, it's not taught very much. So we've been trying to come up with some simple guidelines on, on how to do this. Um, so the first thing is to do what I call brainstorming. Um, you know, make a list of 10 relevant words and phrases, and then use that list to identify 10 relevant items, articles, videos, websites, or so on, uh, by you know, searching, uh, doing an online search, using Google Search or Google Scholar or a newspaper or uh, some more interesting resource in the US. The Library of Congress Chronicling America has um, an enormous archive of newspapers. So you can um, you know, take these relevant items and do some research. Um, and the goal here is to actually find and build an example of the content that's to be retrieved by these particular concepts. And I pick 10 um, for a particular reason. I'm trying to encourage people to, um, to think about uh, how to bound a topic. Um, and one way to do it is to say, I want you to just come up with kind of 10 concepts that are relevant to this particular topic. You could pick 20, you could pick 25, you could pick 100. But 10 is a big enough to challenge you, but small enough to be bounded as an exercise. Um, the third thing to do is to review those 10 relevant items and write down the words and phrases that provide a context for the theme or topic or concept. And the, the trick here is to uh, basically have people look at content items and consider where the salient information about what it's about and why it's important is located. For example, look at the titles, look at the headings, look at any summaries that exist, introductions and conclusions. Um, these are all um, uh, kind of a standard zones in a content item where you might find information that's particularly salient and descriptive about the context of that item. The fourth step is to note any named entities, P 
people, organizations, events, laws, and so on, that might be closely associated with the theme or topic. Um, so I've got an example of gun violence down below, but whatever the concept. So um, what we're doing now is basically building up a semantic network, starting with 10 concepts, um, looking at content items, analyzing those items um, generally, and then zooming in to look at uh, some of the specific types of named entities that might be associated with those concepts. In the fifth step, then, we've got all this stuff. We want to consolidate these terms. So we want to look for duplicates and synonyms, as well as concepts that you might want to combine, even if they're not really synonyms. We call those quasi-synonyms. Um, you want to consider relabeling the term in order to refer, reflect a concept or a category. And also consider and note any relationships between terms. You want to prioritize those terms. Uh, basically, uh, go through them and rank them from, you know, either using a scale of one to three or one to five, or simply rank them um, uh, in, in a totally ranked order. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, um, uh, uh, you don't have to rank the entire list from uh, one to whatever, um, you can go through and, and just rate them as high, medium, low. Go through some process of prioritization. Um, it's an extremely useful activity um, when you're trying to consolidate terms into concepts. Um, and then for each of the concepts that you've come up with, write a query. Um, so things like plurals are usually um, handled automatically by natural language processing, um, but anything that um, uh, uh, doesn't follow uh, basic stemming rules probably need to specify. Um, and then qualify the scope for each term. Basically, consider writing a scope note. What do I mean by this concept? Um, and ask yourself the question whether the term is distinct or whether it requires some further qualification. Um, and then combine those terms into a single nested query with an OR operator. Okay, so this is um, a, a process to build a category um, and build up the terms and phrases that are necessary in order to be able to um, characterize and provide a context for that term. Okay, so that may seem a little bit abstract, but I think it would be helpful if I give you some examples. So I wanted to now give you a case study of a project that I've been working on for some time. Um, so um, the, the case study is for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, or RWJF. Uh, if you're in the States, you've probably heard of them. If you're overseas, probably not. They're active mostly in the US. So I'll tell you a little bit about them. They're the largest philanthropy dedicated solely to health in the US. Um, we've been working with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to develop an enterprise metadata framework and taxonomy to support needs across areas, including program management, research and evaluation, communications, finance, and other areas of their organization. We've also been working with the foundation on methods to apply automation to support taxonomy development and implementation within their various information management applications. So last year, we developed a pilot categorizer for four predefined topics that describe some of the focus areas for the foundation's programs and grant making. And those areas were childhood obesity, disease prevention and health promotion, healthcare quality, um, and health coverage. Um, and we used a tool called Lexalytics, uh, or a company called Lexalytics, their tool is called Symantria. And the goal was to determine the feasibility of building predefined Boolean categorizers for these very broad topics um, that are listed at the bottom of the screen here. Um, and I would point out that not only are, there, are they broad topics, but there's also, um, as you might imagine, a difficulty in trying to develop queries that would dis discreetly and distinctly be able to identify the different context of, for example, healthcare quality versus health coverage. As people, we can understand, or as humans, we can understand those differences, 
But when we work simply with language, um, it can be quite complicated. So the 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 goal of this um, prototype was to try to determine how difficult it would be to scope the context for each category and how accurate and comprehensive those um, categorizers would be. So um, the testing process um, was to identify a test collection of content items with known correct topics. And we focused on um, a set of, um, of 400 short form items, which were summaries um, uh, that were published on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation website. Um, uh, and um, we, uh, we also did a separate um, um, pilot using uh, what we call long form assets that came out of uh, institutional repository. I'm not gonna report on that today, um, but I'm gonna focus on this 400 um, short form assets that were um, either summaries of journal articles or, or what they call briefs, which are issued briefs. Um, the, the, the content was basically just titles and summaries, um, and, it, and they were uh, pre-selected to represent one of these four categories. So we built up Boolean queries for the four target Robert Wood Johnson Foundation topics using the method described in the previous section. This was done without any special tools, just a text editor. Then we cut and pasted them into the Symantria web user interface. Um, Symantria validated the query syntax and either successfully loaded them or returned an error message, which we needed to resolve. Eventually, each of the four queries was successfully loaded. Uh, short form items were then categorized using the Symantria for Excel plugin. In this case, results were returned and evaluated in Excel. So basically, this particular tool has a web interface, and in that web interface, you build the queries, they call them configurations. Um, and what we're looking at here on the screen is a predefined query for health coverage. So you can see it's a fairly complex set of words and phrases that uses Boolean logic to provide specific contexts for these. So it's obviously a lot of different sort of concepts such as healthcare coverage, um, as well as uh, I think we find uh, different parts of it that are related to health insurance that are included in this particular category at the foundation. Um, now this is what we did in this prototype. I'm going to report at the Porto meeting next month about um, actually operationalizing this. And a big part of that process was to take apart this kind of complicated query. This was a um, kind of a hack, um, but had to take this apart and do it in a more uh, componentized way uh, and then assemble those into these queries so that it's much more maintainable. But this was a prototype, so we were trying to do this quick and dirty. Um, and this is what the results um, looked like. So what happened? Overall, the results from both test collections and user interfaces had an 89% precision, which means that 89% of the time when we used these queries and ran them through and ran the content items through this um, Symantria tool, um, we received the right result, meaning that we got the right category, the one that we knew the content item was in. And 11% of the time they were, they were incorrect. Um, but um, only 67% uh, of the items actually returned a, a, a category. So we had four configurations or four of these queries. Um, and uh, when we ran the content through it, only 67% of them return to results. So 33% of them ended up being uncategorized. Um, and, and this is a pretty standard um, uh, kind of a, a result. Um, there's a direct relationship between recall and precision and information retrieval. Uh, generally, um, um, if you increase your recall, you'll decrease your precision. If you um, increase your precision, you'll decrease your recall and vice, and vice versa. Um, they, in, in an ideal world, they are um, uh, completely in balance and will move precisely. We found in practice that it's not a perfect world and they, they're, they're, they, they move generally 
in relationship to each other, but not a, not absolutely. Um, so generally, um, so um, right. So in this particular instance, if we if we try to optimize these um, um, uh, precision and recall, we'd end up with something that's about uh, seventy eight percent is about as good as we could get as we optimize this. Um, um, in, um, uh, in, in, in practice, we're aiming to get something that's on the order of about 80%. That was our, that was our target. Um, so these results would be considered um, uh, really pretty good, although the recall is a, is a bit low. Um, but for the purposes of the prototype, um, it was uh, certainly uh, striking how we were able, with this very uh, crude approach, very quick and dirty approach to build queries to get pretty decent results. Um, so if you want to drill into these results a little bit more to look at where, um, you know, what worked well and, and what didn't, there were some surprising things. Um, so when we look at each of the categories um, independently um, and look at where we were getting the best results, um, we can see that um, healthcare quality and, and health coverage had a very high level of, of precision, very high level of precision. Um, but um, the, uh, the other two categories, childhood obesity and disease prevention and health promotion, um, were, um, were, 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 no, were not so good, although they were well within our objective of getting to about 80% um, accuracy. We were surprised about this because we thought childhood obesity would be a much more distinct topic particularly given this set of content. Um, in fact, in, in practice, it turned out to be more difficult. We think that's probably because we were looking specifically for childhood obesity and not for obesity in general. So obesity in general would tend to be a concept that in fact would end up in this disease prevention and health promotion area. Um, and that's where we think that uh, there were some, some difficulties. But overall, the results are pretty good. Um, and then based on these results, it was decided to build and operationalize a categorization service for all of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation topics. And I'll be talking about the results of this next project, as I said, at the DCMI 18 meeting in, in Porto in September. So um, what we've done is um, kind of talked um, uh, generally about the enabling technologies, um, cloud services, um, um, automated categorization, software as a service, sometimes called cognitive computing, and the Internet of Things. Um, we've talked about the, the value proposition um, that if we can tag content consistently, it can be aggregated and analyzed and used by organizations. And, and we've, we've, we've shown an example um, of, a, of a case study to try to uh, make that a little bit more, um, more realistic. So what I've also said is that much of what's being called artificial intelligence is based on natural language processing or NLP and information retrieval methods. Um, there's renewed interest in using IR methods to tag content in order to be able to aggregate, analyze, and more effectively use it. Um, and as I said, the, these um, trends um, in the um, um, uh, uh, um, in the technical um, ecosystem are making it really possible to to do this. Uh, so, but I would say, and I hope I, I I don't want you to go away and and think that yeah, you know, problem solved. Um, there's a lot. While there's a lot of tools and applications that exist and that are affordable, good implementation skills are really hard to find. Um, and as, and as I, I mentioned, um, people no longer really are familiar with Boolean queries or building Boolean queries or even how to build and curate collections of content that would be good training sets for, uh, for machine learning purposes. So, um, and, and I would say that training and, and expertise of this sort is one of the one of the places you might go to find it, or or communities like the Dublin Core community, um, and um, and I would say that this is something that's that's the missing uh, link in this 
um, in this set. Um, so there's lots of information out there if you're interested in this. Um, here's a set of five kind of places you might go to learn more specifically about these stacks of methods that are available um, out there and then how to, how to work with them. Um, and then, as I said, um, while I don't have it in the slide deck, um, I, I did prepare a list of uh, uh, references to uh, good studies around um, indexer uh, inconsistency, and you can get that um, in, the, in the paper. And I've got both the slides and the paper available at the Taxonomy Strategies website on the homepage, but they'll also be distributed by um, uh, by, um, by ACIST after the webinar. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, that was fairly uh, quick. It's, we've got a fair amount of time left for, for questions and discussions. So I will turn it back over to, uh, to Anna and, and to, and to uh, all of you out there um, listening to the webinar. So please let me know if you've got any questions or if there are other topics you'd like me to talk about. Obviously, I selected uh, some things here, um, but there's certainly much more to discuss. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Very nice webinar. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I, I I would ask the participants to put the questions in the uh, in the question box. Uh, in the meantime, I'll do a, a question that is. Um, uh, this is this is very interesting and works uh, and it, it looks like it works uh, uh, well or very well uh, in the cases that uh, you know you you know about the subject but when you don't know what what you have in hands does it make sense to use machine learning techniques before and then use I mean combine them machine learning techniques with um, uh, Boolean queries. Um, Anna, it's a great it's a great question, um, and it's really around this whole question about subject matter um, experts. Uh, and um, uh, and and one thing to point out is, of course, um, people like myself and other information professionals, we're generalists by training. So part of Part of what I was trying to suggest in the method, the, the sort of eight-step method um, that um, I tried to communicate was a way for people to go through the process of discovering um, uh, how to build a context for a concept that they might not necessarily be an expert on. Um, but I was also pre presenting a very, you know, kind of traditional um, a research approach to it. And absolutely, I, I think that uh, using um, automated technology as a tool to do discovery um, is, is really great. So for example, um, applying keyword extraction technology or summarization on a set of content to pull out um, a set of words and phrases that characterizes a collection of content or even a, a specific content item that might be an important one. Why? Because it's routinely cited, or it's very popular, um, or it's very current, or any reason that you might have. Um, and, then to, and then to have that as raw material that then you know goes into the process. And the tools can be used to refine that somewhat. But uh, generally, in my experience, and I've been working with this technology for a long time, including developing commercial products in the um, in, 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 uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. One of the problems with automated technology as an input to people is that it generates a very large amount of stuff. Uh, so when you do keyword extraction, you're going to get a lot of words and phrases. And, even, and, and the process of deduplicating it and sorting it and refining it um, is, uh, is large. Um, so um, while using automation to help you uh, provide a context or to get started, um, it's, uh, it tends to generate a lot of content. One other idea 
that I think is really important and isn't talked about a lot is that uh, there's a tendency with machine learning to take a, an undifferentiated collection, a large collection of material, like, um, I don't know, a big collection on the web, like an email archive or something. And, you know, that's fine and good, but um, it's, it's very undifferentiated. One thing that is really helpful is to be able to have a targeted collection of content that you process. In other words, you know, if you know that uh, I've got a bunch of poetry or I have a bunch of material about, or, or uh, documents that are about material sciences, it's very helpful to have a collection of content that is um, just not random, you know, a random selection of stuff, but that has some, uh, some purpose or a topic or, or something. <laughs> I don't know. So that, that's something that I think is, is, is often not discussed when we talk about machine learning. There's a tendency to say, give me anything and I'll give you something. And I think that's not necessarily uh, a smart thing to do. And I'll be talking about this some more in Porto as well, because there's some unintended consequences of working with material that has not been curated. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have we have many questions here. Let's Good. let's see if we can address them all. Okay, uh, first question: um, While assessing precision and recall, what are some good ways to define goals for those scores? For example, is uh, zero dot sixty eight precision and zero dot forty recall good enough? What will I miss if I accept this result? Um, yeah, great question. So, um, uh, you know, I um, kind of take an approach to precision and recall that's a, that's a little bit less um, 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 statistical. Let's just <laughs> let's just say um, I'm the the precision and recall that I'm uh, looking at here is based on a uh, working with known uh, we're working with material that we know uh, what the right answer is, and we're simply measuring, we're measuring absolutely how, uh, uh, what we can produce compared to that. And we do blind testing as well. Um, so the, the, the particular statistical measures that you mentioned, I can't really comment on because that's not the way that we approach this, but I would say, you know, kind of in business terms, if you will, that with um, when we're doing these, when we're building these Boolean categorizers, the object, uh, and it was the same when, when we were creating commercial software, our objective was to, uh, was to create 80, 80, you know, 80, 80, roughly 80% 80 precision and recall is what we're aiming for as a, um, as, as an objective. And I usually say plus or minus five percentages. Um, and we can measure that absolutely in terms of items of items retrieved uh, uh, given given a set. And we always do this against test collections, where we know what the right answer is. Uh, although we, uh, when we do the when we do the evaluation, we don't want to know it when we go into it. So we want that collection to be blind, but we do want it to be categorized. Um, so that means that. Um, um, and that's what we're looking for in Boolean categorizers. When we're uh, using other methods like entity extraction and things like that, we usually expect a much higher level of, uh, of accuracy. It's usually not called precision in that case, but well, let's call it that. So with entity extraction, we would expect to get much higher levels of accuracy, um, meaning that we don't expect to extract words and phrases that in fact are not named entities. Um, and uh, so, uh, and people throw around much higher uh, levels of accuracy as being desirable. Um, we're not sure when we're doing when we're doing thematic or contextual categorization that we that we should necessarily aim for anything much greater than 80 percent. Okay, next question. Um, this is a promising approach, but I wonder if it can be applied to a huge amount of information out there. Could you address the scalability issue of this approach? Sure. Um, great point. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so 
I, part of it has to do with the objective of the categorization. And um, so let me just talk about that uh, very briefly. So the goal here is to create a way to be able to um, take a collection that is otherwise indexed and, and searchable by keyword and be able to provide some filters on that. So we're generally looking for broad categorizations. Um, and by broad categ and broad categorizations are um, much smaller sets of concepts than than the kind of subject headings that we've tended to have or indexing schemes in the past. Um, but we do see broad categorizations um, used a, a lot um, uh, and historically used quite a lot. Um, in in addition to the you know more detailed types of what are often called the sorry. Um, so. I, I think our, our idea here is that um, applying it to a broad categorization uh, where we're talking about uh, dozens of categories rather than hundreds or thousands of categories is where we think this type of more detailed approach is appropriate. When we get into larger um, situations, we may, you know, we want to look at additional uh, types of indexing that might be done. And some of that would be to work on some of these named entities. Um, so for example, geography, time periods, um, um, uh, you know, names of organizations, um, uh, names of people. Um, a lot of those uh, you know, are, are, are often what the content's about and why it's important. And then and on top of that, then these broad categories. So that's the idea about how to make this scalable. Uh, the idea is that we keep the number of, that we work with broad categories and we keep the number relatively small. Um, the collection it can be as large as we want, um, but we also want to have these other types of attributes and properties uh, that are associated with content that are more generally related to um, the names of the names of things as opposed to uh, topical types of things. Okay, another question. Uh, I think this is related to the, um, the slides that, that you presented. That is, if AI is used for automated tagging using ground truth data generated from manual tagging process, is it possible for AI tags to ever exceed manual tagging accuracy? That, um, that's a great uh, that's a great point I think so the point I like to make is that what we really want is to improve we want to improve the quality absolutely um, and can, and one way to do that is is with consist is is to use automation to try to drive consistency so as you say if we take a well a, you know a, a collection that's been categorized by people and then use that to train a, um, and assuming that we've got a, a set of discrete examples, and this is the difficulty, getting discrete examples is, is difficult, meaning that the, we have examples that, that apply to only one, one and only one you know, uh, category. Um, it's difficult to find, to find and build those, but assuming that we can, um, uh, we should be able to you know, gen generate automated categorization um, through uh, using those training sets. With, with a pretty high with a pretty high level of accuracy and a high level of consistency and I would say that it, yes it would generally exceed um, uh, modestly you know you, so the rough the rough numbers are 70 versus 80 percent and and vendors will always argue that they're getting much better mm -hmm. results but let's just use those numbers uh, for practical purposes when we're talking about thematic or or sub subject type of indexing um, I think we would get better results. Um, however, uh, it, it, uh, 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 on an absolute basis, and the other thing that we get is when there are errors um, that occur, they they tend to occur consistently. So, if you know, if you tend to make mistakes with a machine algorithm, it, it's going to be pretty consistent. So that means we can we can go and find those, um, and we can either correct them through an exception process where we intervene by hand, or we can try to improve the algorithm by focusing on that particular anomaly. When we have people who are making mistakes, 
the mistakes may not be quite as dramatic and they be, so they'll be difficult to detect and they're also very very difficult to correct because you have to do it almost on a one one for one basis so there are many advantages to using machine methods um, particularly when you do it um, you know in, in a you know we're in a workflow process um, where there's a feedback mechanism uh, so that you can identify anomalies and then I will correct them as a as a batch or try to improve the algorithm based on that anomaly okay there is there is a question here um, that I think you already answered but maybe I don't know if you want to elaborate more that is could the same document piece of content belong to more than one category? Um, yeah, it's a great point. Um, so when we're training uh, content, when we have examples, um, we, we want to try to avoid that. And the reason, uh, the reason is that um, uh, it, cre it creates ambiguity in the, in, in the, um, in the, in the analysis. Um, but, in, but in reality, <laughs> In the real world, obviously, we do have a lot of content that overlaps multiple areas. Um, so, a couple of things to say. Number one, um, when I uh, work with people, uh, people about categorizing content, I always have the challenge: Can you choose one category over another? So this is a bit different than the information professional approach. And I always challenge people to, see, to ask them, is, there, is, one of, is one of these categories more relevant to this content item or more appropriate for this content item than the other? Um, and to try to make that distinction, if at all possible. Um, and if you think about it, historically, when we did subject indexing um, in the past, there was a there were two principles. One was, you know, kind of you want to characterize the content overall, and secondly, you want to um, not necessarily you don't necessarily want to over-index it. Um, so I just want to point out that that while yes, content of course can fit into more than one category, the process for arriving at that decision should be. Uh, a conservative one, I believe, where if at all possible, you should always be trying to make a distinction between which one is most appropriate. And the reason is that I really think these categorization systems are not intended to absolutely, you know, be the only way in which we uh, use this content, but rather they're a part of that, of, of a constellation of methods that are used to work with this content. So, so key idea. It's important to prioritize which is more important. There are lots of different ways that we might implement this in a particular system by having primary and secondary categories. But yes, you're right. The content often is about more than one thing. And but we need to be careful when we make the decision to characterize that content and not take the opportunity to say this is really mostly about this as opposed to that. And this raises many, many indexing issues. I, I'm mostly putting this out there for thought rather than as an absolute answer. Okay, so now uh, at the end we have um, two questions that are uh, related to, to the sources of your data. One is asking for a, a reference of uh, the, the question is, uh, what was the paper you referenced that indicated the inconsistency of indexing? Any chance you can get a copy of a reference? So, um, uh, the second one is uh, on slide, overall trial results, uh, of overall trial results. How did you find incorrectly categorized content, those of 11%? Did you have to look at each result to determine if it was correct or not? Um, okay, so um, the first question is easy about in, uh, inter-index or inconsistency. Yeah, if you, um, I, I've given a copy of the paper um, to Basist, and at the end of that paper, there's a, a, a there's a footnote with a bibliography of citations around inter-index or consistency. 
Um, if you can't find it, you know, send me an email. It, it's also available on the Taxonomy Strategies website, where this webinar is announced, and there's a link from the uh, from the paper, and you can download the paper. Um, but to get to the second question about how this 11% was correct, so um, so uh, the collection that we worked with had been pre-categorized, so we knew, uh, so we could validate. Um, the um, the results based on um, uh, uh, based on the fact that it was a predefined uh, that, that the content had already been categorized by by people or, and by the foundation. Uh, so the 11% correct was simply comparing what the automated method returned uh, with uh, what we had here. Now in this example. Um, I think we were we're looking at a, a set of four categories, so there are 400 examples. So uh, it means that 11% um, uh, of the time in those 400 examples, the results were either uh, false positives or false negatives, meaning that it either gave us a an incorrect category, one that was not the right one, or it didn't give us the um, the you know or or it. Uh, gave us a category that was, uh, and it wasn't the right category. So there's two cases. I'm going to talk about this, um, I, I'd say, um, a, a lot more uh, in Porto because we, when we, when we took this to scale, or as we've been taking this to scale, we've been doing much more intensive um, testing with a, with a much larger, well, with a somewhat larger set. There's 12 categories total, uh, and we're working with 1,000, 1,500 items in the test collection. Um, and we're getting uh, uh, the, the talk will will go into much more detail about about that. But uh, specifically here, uh, while the actual collection was blind to us um, when we ran the results, in other words, we we didn't build the queries based on this collection. The um, the results were known, so we were able to um, identify which ones were correct and which ones were incorrect simply by comparing what the algorithm returned uh, with what in fact was the um, the value that had been assigned um, by the by the foundation thank you Joseph just one last question for me and it has nothing to do with with the, your webinar but with uh, Porto you you talked about Porto several times so you are coming to Porto and you are going to present a workshop, is that it? Um, I'm actually um, presenting a session on categorization in which okay. we'll be talking about um, the, um, the, an update on this case study. Um, and also we'll be talking about some of the unintended consequences of, or, uh, well, what, we, what I call unintentional uh, bias in um, working with uh, content that hasn't been curated. Okay, so the conference, the Dublin Corp conference, will be held in Porto this year in September, from uh, the 10th to the 13th September 2018 in Porto. Uh, webinar uh, 